Okay, welcome to Ag in the Evening for today, August uh, 22nd. Um, my name is Vanessa Coyer Olson. I'm the Forage Extension Specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension at Overton. And tonight's topic is talking about forage insect pest, which for some people it might seem kind of like an odd time being as we're, one, we're extremely dry and extremely hot. And then we're also kind of almost at that point where we're between seasons, where our warm season perennials are soon going to be slowing down. Um, and then thinking about winter forages. But this is a great time, especially considering that we have been dry and there is obviously always a chance of moisture and depending on where you are in the state, your chances may be higher than than some depending on, you know, um, weather patterns or what have you. So, um, and we're gonna talk about forage insect pest and, and how environmental conditions are impact those populations. And that's critical to understand so we can be prepared to manage those if they do become problematic um, for us within our forage systems. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, this is the Ag in the Evening series, which is, is hosted um, by um, Houston County as well as Gregg County. Our county extension agents, um, Joe Smith in Houston County and Shaniqua Davis in Gregg County, um, host these events for us. We do record these events and they are posted on our YouTube channel. Um, if you do not have that link, please let me know and I'll be happy to share that with you. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So our first forage insect pest that we're going to talk about um, that will be of primary concern as we move into the, the fall slash winter, and that is the fall army worm. Now, we can potentially have this insect pest well before fall. Um, in Overton, we have sprayed for or treated for fall armyworms as early as May and June. So their populations are greatly influenced by weather patterns, much more so than seasons. Um, so the armyworm moth does not overwinter in Northeast Texas. It overwinters in South Texas and Mexico. And then as we warm up in the spring, and with wind movement, uh, weather patterns, it, it, they, the moths move into central Texas and on into east Texas um, during that springtime. So even if you haven't seen any fall army worms or any damage on your property this year, you still likely have moths and potentially some larvae in your environment. Just because of hot and drier conditions, they are less reproductive those larvae develop much more slowly, they lay fewer eggs. So we don't see the impact of those populations, even though they might be present in our environment. When we have cooler temperatures along with moisture, that magical combination that promotes um, those populations that really supports their growth and development, they develop much faster, they lay more eggs, they have higher reproductive capacity, and then we end up with these bigger populations that can cause quite a bit of damage within our forage systems. So there are a lot of different larvae that we might see in our environment. Um, and there are actually several army worms. Um, the fall army worm is the one that causes the most damage in our forage systems, whether it's our warm season perennials, such as Bermuda grass and Bahia grass, or in our cool season forages, such as our rye grass, clover, small grains that we might plant in the fall and utilized during the winter and spring. So, um, but there are other larvae that you might see in your environment. And, and a lot of people panic when they see any type of larva because they're concerned or worried about the fall armyworm because we have had years where they've caused a lot of damage and our producers have had to spray multiple times within a season to try to save their valuable forage. So um, some distinguishing characteristics, physical characteristics of the fall armyworm larva now, well, granted, when they're very small, um, the small larvae are, are kind of a green color. They still have that distinguishing Y, white Y on their head. So it still will stick out. As those larvae develop, mature, they obviously get larger. They get up to an inch and a half in length, and they get much darker, almost brown, uh, with two black stripes going down their sides. And the last segment of their larva uh, body, they have four black dots. But the white inverted Y is the most distinguishing characteristic. Now there is a spring armyworm that can be damaging to crops such as uh, corn or wheat, spring wheat that you could possibly see in your forage systems. Um, but 
historically, they have not made a lot of, they have not caused a lot of damage within pasture or hay meadow systems. So <clears throat> identification of those larvas is a great way to know whether or not you need to be concerned about damage potentially to your forage systems. So a lot of people are also curious about what the moths look like. We see a lot of moths, especially at night, around night lights, around barns and houses and stuff. Um, I personally um, don't know that I can distinguish a fall armyworm moth from many other moths, but here are some visuals if you might be of interest. Um, the upper left-hand corner is a male moth, and the lower right-hand corner is a female moth. Their top wings have patterns. Obviously, the male's pattern is is bolder, more distinct compared to the female. Um, it's also a larger moth. Their wingspan is about an inch and a half. And those two lower wings are kind of a translucent with a kind of a brown border or brown edging. Um, so if you're just curious about the moths, but in regards to determining whether or not you should treat for armyworms, locating or scouting for the larva really is the best means of making that decision and or determining if your population is large enough that it's economical to treat. So army worms can be fairly picky in regards to their their forage consumption. They prefer well irrigate they prefer irrigated or well fertilized forage. Um, so they can be a little picky. So they can cause damage in Bermuda grass and even Bahia grass if those forages are fertilized during the summer if we have some outbreaks. Um, at this point of year, where we are at the point where a lot of folks might be thinking about um, planting winter forages such as ryegrass or small grains or even clovers this fall, those forages are going to be highly desirable if, as we receive, if we receive rainfall this fall and winter. So we can have army worm populations until we have a frost. Now, depending on where you are in the state, your average frost state is going to, to vary. For us around Overton and East Texas, our average frost date is November 15th. We all know there have been years where we haven't had a frost until December or maybe even January. So we can continue to have forage insect pests of army worms, grasshoppers, um, even the Bermuda grass dim maggot until we have a frost. So do keep that in mind. Army worms, fall army worms are multi-generational. So that means you can have more than one generation in a season. So a lot of people have often asked, I've sprayed for army worms, so I don't have to spray again, right? That's not necessarily the case. Um, so you could potentially need to spray multiple times within a season or within a year. And several years ago, a lot of producers sprayed six or seven times. Um, you will have to keep in mind as you use products, some of them have a limited use rate so if you are having to spray multiple times, you need to pay attention to those labels. It's likely that you would need to use multiple products throughout if you had multiple events of army worms. So we are primed for army worms because we have been hot and dry. When, if you receive rainfall in your area at some point, even if those, the rest of us have not, um, anybody in the state of Texas, when you receive some moisture, at any point from now until frost, if you receive rainfall, one of the first things you should do is scout for army worms. Um, and especially if our temperatures drop at the same time, which is often the case at this time of year, if we have a storm that comes through or a front that comes through with change in temperature, especially when we've been very hot, um, our temperatures likely decrease, at least temporarily along with the moisture. And that is a prime, that's a prime opportunity for army worms to appear to come out of nowhere, almost as, almost as if they fall out of the sky or they explode out of the soil. Um, so my recommendation at this point in the season, as you move forward making decisions or as you move forward with planting winter forages, that you are prepared to treat for army worms when we have some moisture. So like I mentioned, they do prefer higher quality forage. So if you do plant winter forage, such as ryegrass or small grains, um, Keep in mind that those cool season annuals are going to be much more desirable compared to that warm season perennial Bermuda grass or Bahia grass that's at the end of its kind of at the end of its season. Even if maybe it hasn't gone dormant yet, if you have some rye grass seedlings, small grains, or or clover seedlings, they are going to be much more desirable. And because they are seedlings, they can army worms can actually take out that and stand that stand entirely 
and you could potentially have to replant. Um, so very important if you are planting winter pasture and hope and needing that forage for winter because of low hay supply, lack of hay production this year, then that forage is going to be very valuable, should be very valuable to you as a livestock producer. So the total life cycle for the fall armyworm is, is no more than about 60 days to go from moth all the way back to moth again. So after those eggs hatch, they're in the larva stage. That is when they cause damage. So in the last two to three days of their larva stage, they consume 85% of their diet. So obviously, the larger the larva, the more damage they cause. So scouting is critical. And understanding that when you're scouting, because it's multi, they are multiple gener multi-generational, not all of your army worms are going to be the same size at the same time. And we'll talk about that when we talk about treatment options. After that 28 days <clears throat> as a larva, they pupate into the soil and then reemerge as a moth. So about 60 days for their total life cycle. Um, but they're not all going to be at the same stage. So like I said, multiple generations. So it can feel like you have army worms quite frequently. So as like I mentioned, scouting is, is the only way, the best way to determine whether or not you have army worms um, as a result of moisture. Um, and then whether or not you have a population size that is economical to treat. So this is, um, so scouting, I would recommend scouting in the morning when we off might, might be cooler, um, as well as we likely have some dew on the ground they are principally night feeders. So we can see them actively feeding in the middle of the day, even though it might be hot or sun's full out. But scouting during the morning is, is a great opportunity when it's cooler for you and they're most likely feeding. You'll have more feeding activity. And so you'll likely notice how large the population may or may not be. It also allows you, gives you that opportunity to treat that day. A lot of folks will say, I have army worms, I'm gonna spray tomorrow. Well, they can do substantial damage overnight. Um, so it's critical that we're scouting frequent, frequently when weather populations really promote those populations and that we're prepared to treat and that we're not having to, to wait a day or two because we can lose quite a bit of forage. Remember, when they're in that last two to three days of their larva stage, they are consuming 85% of their diet. All right, so a question popped up, we'll go ahead and address it. We won't have army worms if it does not rain and turn grass back to at least green stems, question mark. They will not appear on the straw light ground cover. All right, so that's an excellent question. So army worms do prefer high quality forage. You do likely have some army worms already in your environment. They're just not as active because there's not, as, a, not a lot of forage available. The heat and dry conditions just does not promote their populations. However, if we receive some rainfall, whether that's, you know, and right now they're not really predicting us to receive any moisture anytime soon, at least not for, for me in East Texas. When we look at the 10 day forecast, it still remains pretty dry. And if we look at the drought monitor, they're predicting us to be in, in dry, abnormally dry conditions, even possibly through the end of November. But at some point it is gonna rain. And that could be November, that may, that could be, it could be earlier if we have happened to get a tropical storm or, or something, something changes. The weather can const, is constantly changing. So my recommendation is even though we're hot and dry right now, it's to be prepared that if we do get moisture and that grass responds, and you know, even if we get moisture and that grass may take it a little bit to respond, but when we get moisture that you start scouting, you start looking for for those army worms. Um, so that's my recommendation at this point. That is when we are, we are primed to have army worms is when we have been in a drought or dry conditions and then we get some moisture, we get some rainfall. Um, so the, the point is just to be prepared um, to, to start thinking about, you know, what is the value of your forage? And that's something we have to keep in mind when we start looking at treatment options you know, at this time of year, your Bermuda grass is very short, likely it could be overgrazed or it just hasn't grown very much in the past couple of months because we've been very dry and it's so hot. So if we did end up with army worms in November, is that forage valuable? Um, however, if that forage, that worm season perennial may not be as valuable to you. 
But if you've taken the risk and overseeded with ryegrass or some small grains and hopes for moisture that we'll, we'll, we will get some at some point and hopes of moisture and some cool season forage production, that cool season forage that you planted is gonna be pretty valuable. So as those seedlings pop up as a result of moisture and, and some good weather, you want to protect those, those cool season annuals because they're going to be very valuable to you. And those seedlings are at greater risk of completely being destroyed by army worms. So preparation is, is a key here. So like I mentioned, army worms are primarily night feeders. So um, that's why scouting can be critical. You can also use sweep nets to scout for army worms. Um, there's some great publications on how to do that. But once again, scouting early in the morning when there is dew and they're primarily feeding, it's a great opportunity to actually be able to, to scout, to see larvae and to be able to count those larvae and determine if you are at that economic threshold um, for treatment of those pests. So the rule of thumb is, is three or more fall army worms per square foot. Whether you are scouting by just walking through a field, we can regularly pick them up on our boots or even on equipment such as a four-wheeler or a mower potentially. Um, but you can also scout using a sweep net um, if you're so inclined um, to, to be able to count those, those number of army worms. So three or more per square foot is, is at the point of which we consider it to be economical to treat considering the value of your forage. So I mentioned that earlier, those warm season perennials at the end of the season may not be as valuable to you as those cool season annuals. But we have a lot of options in regards to insecticides and some of them are very economical and, presides, and provide some residual control. And that can be critical is in regards to economics, to help reduce the number of treatment applications um, and to, to maximize your impact on those populations because they are multiple generations. So we have different classes of insecticides and one of those classes is our pyrethroids. So pyrethroids are generally used insecticides that have activity on a lot of different insect pests beyond even what we're gonna talk about tonight. And a lot of them are labeled for different crops, not just forages. All the ones that I mentioned tonight are labeled specifically for pasture hay production, whether that's in warm season perennials or cool season annuals. But as always, when using pesticides, remember that the label is the law. So please refer to the label for specific information on crops that are appropriate for these products to be used in max use. Um, like I said, in, in years where we have to spray multiple times, we wanna make sure we're spraying within that labeled rate. And some products, especially some of our pyrethroids do have max use rates. So a majority of the products that I'm gonna talk about tonight do require a license. There are some that I will point out that do not require a license. So for those of folks who do not have a pesticide license, you still have some great options as far as insecticides for control of all of the pests that we're gonna talk about tonight. So our pyrethroids are products whose active ingredient ends with T-H-R-I-N. So Mustang Max here is an example of a pyre pyrethroid. The active ingredient is data cypermethrin. So this is gonna become important as we talk about the Bermuda grass stem maggot, uh, but we will get there. So I did want to mention um, in regards to making insecticide or pesticide decisions, I always recommend that we determine the cost per acre, because if we look at the cost per gallon or two gallons of a product, we might unfortunately choose something that ends up being more expensive on a cost per acre. We should also look at things like haying or grazing restrictions, as well as does that product provide any residual control. So carbaryl or seven is a very popular pesticide. It's used in gardens, around homes. It's labeled for use in pastures and hay meadows. There are some grazing and hay restrictions with carbaryl, and it provides no res no no residual control. Um, so it and it is on a per acre basis fairly expensive, one of the more expensive products. And it it's tricky because it's cheaper often on a per gallon basis or per unit of product basis. However, when we look at the cost per acre, it's often more expensive than a lot of our other options. And then it provides no residual control. 
And so I always recommend when we're looking at pesticides, insecticides, that we look at products that could potentially provide some residual control so we can reduce the number of applications that we're having to make and hopefully have longer periods of control and less impact on our forage systems by those pests. Diflubenzeron Dimelin 2L is a trade name. There are other generics of Diflubenzeron. Unforgiven is one, so is Durant. Um, Diflubenzeron is an insect growth regulator, so timing of application is very critical. For armyworm control, those larvae need to be very small. Um, needs Diflubenzeron needs to be applied well before those larvae reach half an inch or, or much larger. So it's an insect growth regulator. So it has it's consumed by those pests, by the armyworms, and then it interrupts their life cycle, their transition to the next larva stage. So it keeps them from growing, um, basically. So it is not gonna be an instant kill. So a lot of times when we're trying to control insects, we'd like to spray them with an insecticide and see them writhing in pain pretty quickly. And that's not necessarily going to be what you see with Diflobenzeron. However, as an insect growth regulator, it will provide residual control of two to three weeks as long as that forage is not harvested. Um, so it's an excellent insecticide. It's typically fairly inexpensive on a cost per acre basis. And now that there are some generics, um, right now I think it's averaging about a dollar to two dollars per acre. If I remember correctly, Carboreal is closer to $9 an acre. So it's a product that's cheaper on a per acre basis and provides some residual control. Now, I mentioned earlier that not all of the larvae when you're scouting are going to be the same size. Some are going to be small, some are going to be larger. So a good recommendation is a mixture of Diflubenzeron with a pyrethroid. The pyrethroid will have activity on the larger larva, um, and then the in, the Diflubenzeron will take care of smaller larvae and then provide some residual control. Pyrethroids do not provide any residual control. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. Here are some additional pyrethroids. I will point you towards a spreadsheet later if you're not aware of or familiar with that has a lot of these products listed and can help you evaluate those economic decisions when it comes to comparing different products and looking at cost per acre versus just cost per um, product. So there is a, in the past couple of years, there's been a Renaxapir active ingredient. Um, you may be familiar with Prevathon. I think you can still come across Prevathon on the market. Um, that product from what was previously Bayer that is now in view was, was purchased by FMC and they have renamed that product Vanticore. Um, so just know if you buy Prevathon to follow the label directions for Prevathon, if you purchase Vanticore, make sure you follow those label directions. They both have the same active ingredient. However, the percentage of active ingredient is different for those products, um, those trade name products. And so the use rate or application rate will be very different. So always read the label. Corrigin is another version of a Renaxapir product, and then Besiege, which is about 9% Renaxapir, and then it also includes a Lambda Cyhalothrin, a general, a general use pyrethroid. Um, so that can be that can come into handy when we start talking about the Bermuda grass stem maggot. But this Renaxapir ingredient, active ingredient, does dual control for armyworms as well as grasshoppers. Um, so it's an excellent product. Um, in the form of Vanticore or Corrigin does not require a license. So that's a great opportunity for a lot of producers um, that do not have their pesticide license. Besiege, because of that pyrethroid, does require a pesticide license for use. Um, so this is has been an excellent product, provides excellent control on farm armyworms with two to three weeks of residual control. I will tell you that coverage is critical. Um, with any of these products with fall army worms because they, they march across the field, making sure that you have good coverage and you, you spray wide borders will be critical to help to reduce that potential impact on your pastures or your hay meadows. So just briefly summary on fall army worms, and I'll continue to answer any questions if, as they come up. Three or more fall army worms per square foot. 
Um, scouting is, is the best way. And like I said, since we've been dry, if, when we get some rainfall this fall, winter, if we haven't had a frost, um, definitely scouting should be a, a top priority, especially if you have valuable forage, whether that's cool season forages that you've planted, um, they can really decimate a field and they will destroy a field overnight. Um, and then cause much more damage on any seedlings as opposed to an as well-established field, previously established field. So moving on to grasshoppers, um, I'm sure a lot of you noticed there was quite a few grasshoppers this year. Um, their populations are also highly motive, highly influenced by weather. Uh, grasshoppers are exothermoregulators, so they have to absorb heat, sunlight, in order to regulate or control their body temperature. So... Their populations tend to be prolific when we have hot and dry conditions, which this year has been prime for that um, once we stopped receiving rainfall. So I have seen quite a bit of grasshoppers this year, especially with our warmer, drier conditions. So their total life cycle is about 60 days from hatching um, to the point of laying eggs again. So our weather from season to season influences the next season's populations. So those egg pods start hatching in the spring when our soil temperatures increase and our temperatures warm up. So if we warm up much earlier, which there have been years where we have been pretty warm in March and April, they can start hatching earlier. Now, other years we stay cooler longer. They may not start hatching until May or June. So that obviously impacts how long of a, a how long they are active during that summer time as well as how long they have an opportunity to lay eggs. Um, so as long as we stay warm, even on into the fall, so if we don't have a frost until December, grasshoppers can continue to lay eggs up until that point and continue to cause crop damage up into that point as well. So when they hatch, they are referred to as nymphs. They haven't developed their wings yet. They go through molting stages until they do develop their wings, at which they're considered an adult. Um, and females are highly can be highly reproductive, especially if weather really promotes that. Um, they are a single generation insect. However, there are 150 species in Texas. And so it feels like they're multi-generational because you have, it feels like you constant, potentially can feel like you constantly have grasshoppers hatching. And it can seem that way um, because of the different species. However, there are five primary species that cause the most crop damage for us in Texas. So grasshoppers, excuse me, consume half of their body weight every day. So obviously the larger the grasshoppers, the more damage they can cause. And they are not very picky eaters. They will consume Bermuda grass, Bahia grass, rose leaves, what have you, even during a drought of 2011, they consumed plastic plot flags of mine on a herbicide trial. So they're not very picky eaters. Um, so even if you're not fertilized or irrigated, they can still cause substantial damage to your, to your forage systems. So these are the five most wanted, um, the five species that cause the most damage in, in Texas in crops. This is a great picture from 2011. We were very hot and dry, um, and we had huge populations of, of grasshoppers. And this was on that herbicide trial of mine where they actually consumed the plot flags. Um, they got pretty desperate. So they ate the leaves, ate all the leaves off my herb off of my weeds, uh, which impacted the herbicide activity, of course, um, and then ate any other valuable forage that might have been within that area. So they are, can be, do have high reproductive capacity. So during a good year, that could be obviously a year where we have uh, warmer, drier years that promote their populations. They can lay quite a bit of eggs, even though they're single generation. And those hatches start when we warm up in the spring, and that can vary from year to year, really depending on our weather patterns. Um, and as we know, that, that varies quite a bit from year to year. So as far as their habitat, they do prefer vegetation with an open canopy. Like I mentioned earlier, they are exothermoregulators. So I like to say they're kind of like teenagers. They lay out in the sun a lot in order to, to regulate their body temperature. So areas that are open, 
but have vegetation for feeding are are high um, highly salt out. Um, when we do have some moisture and humidity in the spring, that can promote some fungus or some diseases that can help to control those populations. Um, now, however, you know, when we are warm and dry, that obviously prevents fungus um, growth and can um, promote, you know, obviously promote those, those populations. Unfortunately, we can still have population success. And so even though we saw some fungus issues this year and some of our warm season perennials, especially at the beginning of the season, because we did have quite a bit of moisture in parts of Texas, we've still had pretty big populations of grasshoppers as we've gotten warmer and drier as the season had gone on. So those warmer and drier conditions really promote growth of the nymphs as well as increases reproductive capacity. So that's why we see greater populations with hot, dry conditions. Oh, got trigger happy there, sorry. So as far as the economic threshold for grasshoppers, it is eight or more per square yard. So in this table on the, the right, if you look at the rating for threatening, that is the what we would consider to be an economic threshold. And if you look at the field, uh, the field rating, and that would be for both cropland and rangeland, so that would include pasture, hay production, it's eight to 14 within a square yard. So eight or more grasshoppers within a square yard. So that is the point of which we recommend treatment. I also recommend as you, as the season begins and as you're scouting, um, be mindful of areas of high vegetation, whether that's along a fence line or on the edge of your property or on the edge of a field where maybe some grass or weeds have really grown up. Um, if we can reduce some of that desirable vegetation with mowing, shredding, or maybe spraying with some herbicides, um, that can help to deter some populations from our property. Or you may notice that in those higher vegetation areas, you might notice some smaller grasshoppers. And that could be a great place to start with your insecticide application um, and have a greater impact and help reduce and keep some of that population from moving into your, your cropland or your pastures or your hay meadows. So a lot of the products that I talked about for armyworms are also labeled for grasshoppers. There are a few pyrethroids that are not labeled for grasshoppers. So make sure you are reading that label for those particular products for any product that you're using. Diflobenzeron as an insect growth regulator does have activity on small grasshoppers. So once again, um, great opportunity to have some residual control, but once again, your grasshoppers aren't all going to be the same size at time of application. So mixing that with a pyrethroid can help control some of the larger grasshoppers, as well as provide some residual control. Um, several of our pyrethroids, remember those active ingredients end with THRIN. Um, they are general use products that do not provide any residual control. The Renaxapir products are also labeled for grasshopper control. Uh, Vanticore, Besiege, Corrigin, Prevathon, um, if that is, if you find that's available or if you still have on, that on hand, um, has excellent control on grasshoppers, provides two to three weeks of residual control. Um, based on some testimonies, and this is specifically for grasshoppers, of producers that have found for grasshopper control with the Renaxapir active ingredient, instead of spraying every square inch of their property, if they spray kind of in strips, um, so spray a swath, skip a swath, spray a swath, um, kind of a, a stripe pattern across their field, they still have excellent control with the Renaxapir products on grasshoppers. Now that is specific to grasshoppers. For armyworms, you need to cover every square inch. You need to make sure you have good coverage with these products for, for that particular pest. So moving on to our last insect pest, uh, the Bermuda grass dim maggot. Um, hopefully most of you have are well aware of this particular pest. It was first reported in Texas in 2012. Um, if you have Bermuda grass, you have the Bermuda grass dim maggot. Um, whether we're not really sure, do not have defined information or research that shows, you know, a defined weather pattern and how that influences populations. I think how populations are influenced by weather patterns is 
how weather influences forage production and our Bermuda grass growth. So it is primarily a pest of Bermuda grass and star grasses. It is pest, this pest is not native to the United States. It had been previously identified in um, California and, and um, Hawaii. And then before it was detected or reported in Texas, it had been reported in some other southeastern states, including Georgia back in 2009 and 2010. Um, so Bermuda grass, whether that is in a pasture system, a turf system, um, or a lawn system, lawn, golf courses, turf system versus and a pasture or hay meadow, um, it is not picky. So just can be, it is a pest of Bermuda grass. It is not a pest of Bahia grass or any of our other warm season perennial forages that we use in Texas. Um, but if you have Bermuda grass, you do have the Bermuda grass stem maggot. So the actual pest, um, the adult is a fly. We'll see pictures here shortly. And the the stage of the stage at which the Bermuda grass stem maggot causes damage to the Ber Bermuda grass is when it is the maggot, hence the name Bermuda grass stem maggot. So the fly lays its eggs on the Bermuda grass plant. The egg hatches. The maggot burrows into the stem of the plant, moves to the first node, the top joint of that plant eats the plant material, and that results in the loss of the top two to three leaves of that Bermuda grass plant. Now that one incident doesn't kill your Bermuda grass plant. However, if it goes untreated, that Bermuda grass, every time it tillers and produces new shoots, it can be reattacked um, by the Bermuda grass stem maggot, and you can continue to cause some serious damage if, it, if it's left untreated. So this is the adult fly. Uh, fairly small. The female is smaller than the male. Um, it is smaller than a house fly, um, and it just it flies pretty close within the canopy of that Bermuda grass system. Um, so it's not something that's going to be easily identified in regards to the fly. Basically, we are looking for damage. That's the much easier means of determining whether you have this pest or not. The maggot is very small, about an eighth of an inch. And since it is within that plant, it's hard to, to find or to see. Um, sometimes if you, if you have seen some damage and then you see some other plants that the leaves are just starting to discolor, you might be able to cut into that stem and actually find the maggot. Um, but it, it's pretty tricky. So typically what we're just scouting for is the damage, unfortunately. And the damage is that loss of those top two to three leaves. So as you look across the field, your field may look like it has um, suffered from a light frost or a chemical burn, whether it's from fertilizer or herbicide. But if you go and you pull on those top two to three leaves and you can pull them out, then it is the result of Bermuda grass stem maggot damage. It is not a herbicide or, or a chemical burn. Um, and you can also look at timing of those herbicide or fertilizer applications and rainfall patterns um, to determine that it's not likely that. Um, so the total life cycle for the Bermuda grass stem maggot is three weeks. So it's a very short life cycle compared to 60 days for army worms or grasshoppers. So very short life cycle. Um, so the fly lays its eggs on the plant, that egg hatches, the maggot burrows into the stem, it feeds for seven days, and then it pupates into the soil. And then in another seven to 10 days, it reemerges as the fly. Um, so our management recommendations are based on that short life cycle. Now, I, have, I haven't personally seen any Bermuda grass stem maggot damage this year, but because we have been so hot and so dry, our Bermuda grass production has been limited. Um, so a lot of our pasture systems have, have continually been grazed, and grazing will actually help kind of control those populations because livestock, cattle, horses, goats, what have you, are consuming that top portion, those top leaves. So they're kind of helping to control that population. I do get more reports of the Bermuda grass stem maggot when we have good forage production. So we have good growing conditions. Um, they're not necessarily picky in regards to fertilized or unfertilized um, forage Bermuda grass. It comes down to just having forage, just having that Bermuda grass plant. Um, so when we do have good growing conditions, maybe we have a lower stocking rate, we have more forage than is being consumed by our livestock, then we're likely to see damage in a pasture system. 
where we see the most damage is in a hay meadow, because when we do have good growing conditions, we're only harvesting that forage every three to four or five weeks, depending on our particular harvesting schedule, as well as weather, what have you. So because it's just standing there, you're likely to see damage in that hay meadow because nothing's consuming that top portion of those, those plants and potentially removing some of that maggot activity from those systems. So the University of Georgia has been successful at doing some research on the Bermuda grass stem maggot. And based on some greenhouse work, they found that there are some preferences as far as Bermuda grass varieties or cultivars for the Bermuda grass stem maggot. So in this particular uh, evaluation, the pot on the left is actually a star grass. So we don't grow any star grass in Texas, um, but Tifton 85, a Bermuda grass, a hybrid Bermuda grass that a lot of folks use for pasture or hay production is actually a cross between Bermuda grass and a star grass. So for us, Tifton 85 is the closest thing to a star grass and it looks very similar because it has a very open canopy, very broad leaf, uh, very stemmy appearance compared to coastal or common. And common Bermuda grass is in the pot on the right. So very fine leaf, fine stem, very dense canopy. Um, well, the University of Georgia was able to determine based on greenhouse activity that Bermuda grass stem maggots prefer those denser canopy Bermuda grasses, whether that's common, coastal, Alicia, Tifton 44, what have you, and a lot of our seeded varieties as well, compared to something like star grass, such as Tifton 85. I've actually seen this for myself in a, a trial Bermuda grass stem maggot evaluation I did several years ago. I had two fields. The only thing separating them was a barbed wire fence. One was Tipton A5, one was coastal Bermuda grass. I consistently had more damage in my coastal Bermuda grass field than I did the Tipton A5. I still had flies and I still had some damage, but there was obviously a preference to the coastal Bermuda grass compared to the Tipton A5. And that we think that is primarily because of that denser canopy where that fly likely feels more protected compared to a more open canopy system. So how do we manage the Bermuda grass stem maggots? So right now our target is the fly. Um, there has not been any research to show that any insect growth regulators or Renaxapir products um, have substantial activity on the Bermuda grass stem maggot. So our recommendations based on, on research is if you have damage in a hay meadow is to harvest as soon as possible. The longer you delay harvesting, you're going to have a greater impact on your yield. So it's going to decrease your yield. The longer you have a feed, the greater feeding opportunity you have, the more time they have to feed and lead to the loss of those top two to three leaves. So we recommend harvesting as soon as possible. Once that forage is harvested, we recommend making an application with a pyrethroid insecticide. And remember, those active ingredients end with T-H-R-I-N. So lambda cyhalothrin, cyfluthrin. Um, beta cyflutherin, those are all pyrethroids that end with THRIN. So, um, and then in another seven to 10 days after that initial application, come back with a second application because at harvesting, those maggots are going to pupate into the soil. So, that first application will take care of um, those flies that are already in the environment, hopefully. And then any maggots that pupated into the soil, remember they re-emerge in another seven to 10 days. So hopefully with that second application, you're take care, taking care of those flies that have emerged as a result of those maggots. Um, if you have damage in a pasture system, making an application with a pyrethroid and then following again with a second application in another seven to 10 days, because you'll likely have some more maggots that will reemerge in that process um, between those applications to try to impact those populations. Now, there has been some testimonials from several folks. This is not research-based, just testimonial that have used diflubenzeron, the insect growth regulator for armyworms or grasshopper control and compared to fields where they did not use diflubenzeron, they feel like and they think they had less Bermuda grass stem maggot damage. Um, so that could be a potential added benefit to using diflubenzeron or that insect growth regulator for armyworm and grasshopper control. It could have a side benefit in helping to control some of that Bermuda grass stem maggot population. 
There, there's not currently any research that supports that. There are those are testimonials, but it is a an, an fairly inexpensive product based on a cost per acre that provides residual control. So it is something that I would recommend for army worm or grasshopper control. And if you have the side benefit of some Bermuda grass stem maggot control, that's an excellent, excellent option. So I do want to tell you about a spreadsheet as we wrap up this evening on the Forge Facts website under publications. It is the first uh, spreadsheet that shows up. It is a um, at the top of that list. It is a herbicide and insecticide cost per acre spreadsheet. We do update this every year because there are often changing of product names or new products potentially um, that are available, whether it's an insecticide or a herbicide. So the insecticides are on a separate tab and they are grouped by active ingredients. So all the pyrethroids are grouped together. Um, so you can locate those that have activity on the Bermuda grass stem maggot. And then it tells you whether or not that product is labeled for grasshoppers and army worms or just one of those. And then it has um, where you can, the only information you can change is the cost per unit. So cost per gallon of a product, and then it will calculate your cost per acre at a couple of different application rates. <clears throat> so you can compare different products more specifically on a cost per acre basis. So that helps to make more economic decisions. If we can look at the cost per acre versus just the cost per product. Um, just keep in mind that some of these products provide residuals or inactive active ingredients, and they will all be grouped together as well or diflubenzeron with the insect growth regulator. Um, so you have to keep that in mind when you're looking at cost as well. It may be a little bit more expensive, but it's providing some soil residual. Um, so that's an excellent resource to help in regards to determining or looking at cost per acre. It is not a replacement for labels. So remember to read the label for all of these products um, to make sure they are labeled for your situation and any grazing or hain restrictions. Um, other information that you might need to know. So with that, I will be happy to answer any questions. You can, you're welcome to unmute or you can use the chat feature if you prefer, but I'll be happy to address any questions that you might have. 